my name is Matt Bunzel. I've been with Lada Creed about 18 years now. Um, here in the, uh, the Northeast, our mothership, the, the home office is in Bethany, Connecticut, which is right by New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, family owned and operated company by uh, the two gentlemen uh, who are the sons of Dr. Henry Rothberg, who started the company. He was a chemical engineer that um, came from a company actually called Uniroyal, which most of you are probably familiar with and started uh, playing with some of the liquid latexes that he was working with there and started mixing them with cement because his family was in the tile and masonry business and uh, from there kind of came out with all these different products. Um, we're going to talk real quick about uh, the system that you reviewed upstairs and uh, as opposed to kind of the old school system with using uh, bloody knuckles and wire lath and, and so forth to moving to something like permabase which is easier to use and lightweight. Uh, we're going to just go over a couple of different installations of them. Uh, what I want to touch base on first is our air and water barrier. As you can see up here, they have the air and water barrier. They have a couple of coats here uh, and one coat here. This material is a liquid applied uh, air and water barrier that is going to get um, applied with either a roller. Or I'm going to put some up in just a moment with a... Uh, a paintbrush or in very large areas. We just did one out in the Marlboro area. It was about 60,000 square feet. It was put on with a sprayer. Most guys will tell us if you don't have six or 7,000 plus square feet of wide open area, sprayer is kind of not worth it because you spend more time cleaning it out and fussing with it than you do actually spraying material. Uh, but this material is applied um, in, in two coats. Uh, the first coat you can see right up the top here is basically see-through, uh, which is the first light coat. And then the second coat, you shouldn't be able to see through, okay? Uh, when you have this material, you got you also have, if needed, uh, this here, which is a wet film gauge. Okay, and this thing here, if you take a look at it, it just has these teeth that are at different sizes. And all you do is, when you do your installation, I'll put a little material up here. You notice that when it goes on, okay, it's lighter in color, kind of a, a light, creamy, grayish green. Okay, this material is just going on now. Um, the material as it dries will turn kind of an olive color green. So you know that it's dried and ready to go. You don't have to go in and be fussing with it and touching it and seeing it's all over your fingers. But that color, still a little wet. It's this color here, it's dried and ready to go. You typically find uh, with a little bit of air transfer and outside, your first coat's good to go in about 20 minutes. Second coat just shortly after that. Uh, the gauge thickness, if you want to try that, just simply you take it right here and it's going to have the different ratings or thicknesses on it. You're just going to take that, you're going to dip it right into the material there, and you're going to judge it based on, there's a number, mill thickness, and a number there, and whichever one it hits in between the two, it hits 30 but doesn't hit 40, you can figure it's about 35. So it's a quick way to tell. Once you get used to using it, most people aren't going to use these, they're just going to do it by gauging <coughs> and coating. Okay? In addition to this material here, the first coat, like we said, is going to go on. You can paint that in either direction. I always recommend second coat. We do in the opposite direction. Just make sure we get any voids, holidays, or anything like that, and we get those all cleared up. We also have a uh, reinforcing tape here that I put. Can't really see it, but it goes down through here. This just simply gets applied. It's like this right here. Most guys will call it the toilet paper rolls when you call up here and say, I'm looking for a couple of the reinforcing fabric or the toilet paper rolls. That's what guys will think of. This right here, you just strip it off in the area that you need. If you're doing some coves or some corners, and maybe you have a small crack there that you're concerned with, you want to put that over it just to help the material from settling into it. Right? And it gets laid into the wet material. Just as you lay it in, you're going to paint another coat right over it. That is considered one coat. As soon as that cures, you're going to add the second or top coat right on top of that. Right? If you need to get into some sort of a cove or corner or something of that nature, just simply take roughly a six inch swatch of material like this here, okay, and cut a slice into, uh, into the material about halfway. And I always say, so it looks kind of like a, uh, a fat guy's pair of pants there. All right, we got it like that. And then what we do is just take a, uh, looks like a pretty fit crowd so I can say that here, okay? Just dip a little bit of material onto that one side you have here and when you take the two and you kind of flip it over like so bang we've got ourselves a corner okay tuck that right in the corner dab it in go up it's a nice easy way to work with a corner there okay keep that in mind 
Okay, so we've got that material there, it's gonna come across. As always, you can see here, we have the outline resistant tape, whether it's two inch, three inch, four inch, you've got there. In most cases, we're gonna recommend that you take that material and that goes up any of the seams or coves as well, uh, along with a scratch coat of the material that you're using. Allow that to cure prior to going over, okay? That'll help with any bit of movement there. Any question on that? That, no. If you're going over, say, poured concrete, yep. using that stuff, okay. does moisture content of the, the existing concrete make a difference yeah. to that stuff? Yes, it does, yeah. So you're gonna be looking at, you want an RH of typically somewhere below 75, 75 or below, um, depending on whether it's lightweight concrete, depending on what it is that you're going over, if it's in Syria, inside, if it's had AC going, or if it's had, depending on the atmosphere, it can change hugely. It can mm -hmm. change from day to day. So we recommend in that, in that particular case, just do a little test. If it's a little higher than that, we can take a look at it, maybe do some testing for you and see if there's another way to kind of skin the cat, but yeah, good question. You okay. typically want to be 75 or below. Could I just add to that one other kind of common sense way of thinking about this is you pour an outside set of concrete steps, you're going to veneer it, and so you're going to want to use this. Wait 28 days. There's no, it's, it's difficult with all this rain we've been getting, it's difficult because it can change so much you know, like you say, below 75, 70, whatever, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, with these days, uh, I mean, we've had pretty much flood conditions, so it's yeah. really tough this year, but you gauge it, if you have questions, and we'll put you in touch with somebody to do some moisture tests. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a, a few different um, uh, mortars we're gonna talk about. We have the Embus veneer mortar, which we're gonna put up here, which is a great product for exterior. It's a great product for non-sag, great pair product if you need to put something maybe overhead if you had an entryway or something like that, press it up there, it has great hold. They also have another product called High Bond that they use here that we, we specify and recommend a tremendous amount as well. Um, basic difference between that one there, this one has more of the non-sag properties you're gonna be looking for. So if you're looking to put something on there without having it slip all the way down the wall, uh, the, the High Bond, uh, is is uh, great for if you're doing something and you uh, you have submersible or for some reason you have a section say you're doing a fireplace inside or something like that and you had a section that was going over uh, exterior gray plywood it would be rated for that as well so there's a couple different uh, variations based on uh, your specific jobs let's take a look at it and we can make the, the perfect recommendation for you okay with any of the materials that you're using out there you want to make sure and let them slake for five to eight minutes and basically what that means is Mix them up, as we said, about two minutes, okay, uh, with the drill. Let them sit for a good five to eight minutes, and then hit them again for about another two minutes. And what that's gonna do is you asked about working time. Um, if you don't give them that time to slake, like this material right here, if you start to feel it, it's, it's warming up, setting up, um, you will probably have about 12 to 15 minutes of working time with this. Isn't a tremendous amount, okay? And that is the true with a, a lot of cement products. You let it sit, you let it slake, you let the moisture come through it, okay? And then you hit it again to remix it, and you're gonna find that you extend the, the pot life on the stuff up to, depending on the temperature and where you are, probably 45 to 60 mm -hmm. minutes. And you're only good. mixing with water, correct? Just with water, yep, yep. What's that? Is it possible to over mix it? You have to be cautious of that? No, no, you, you, you die of boredom before you open okay. it. So, um, <laughs> you can, and, you're gonna play with it too. You're gonna to find, depending on the temperature, where you use it. You can put some material up. We can put this up and find that it sags a hair a bit, so we're gonna tighten it up on the next one. Uh, especially the first couple times you guys are using it. Um, I always say to people, get two or three bags. If you wanna try a bag, we'll get you two bags. Um, mix it per the instructions, but if it's 85 degrees out, it's gonna work slightly different than it may work if it's 50 degrees out. You're gonna kind of play with it. Um, I have contractors all the time come back to me and you'll have two standing side by side next to each other at a counter like here. One likes it mixed a little loose, one likes it mixed a little tighter. It's kind of personal preference what they like to do. It's just like regular mortar laying bricks. Yeah, yeah, it really is. What's really the uh, lifetime in the bucket? When you mix it, can you go to lunch, come back, remix it and go? So, I wouldn't say that long. Uh, pot life on something like this, you're probably somewhere around an hour or so, yeah. okay? You're gonna find the material, if we get it up on the wall, if we skim it up on the wall, uh, it may skim over quicker. If we have, if the sun's beating on it certainly, or if we have a hot wall, or if we have the air coming across it, you might find that it skims over quicker, so you need to take your trowel and kind of move across it again. Uh, but in the bucket, you're probably looking at, depending on how you mixed it, temperature, everything else, uh, 45 minutes to an hour, give or take. So. Let me 
me just add, and then I'll be quiet. What's nice about the average system to the perturbation, you can see about the absorption rate is less than 8%. So what you're doing with the, with the mixture, with the air water barrier, with the two coats, you're actually saving a lot of money if you go into a nether vacuum or that's a higher, a higher absorption rate. So it's a nice feature with, with, with a lot of the nethers. So notice when uh, you scoop up a, a load of this material here, um, the, the body on it, it's nice and uh, kind of creamy. Yep. It spreads real nice. Okay. So. There's a bucket of sponge if you want to wash off the hands. No, I'm just looking at the ingredients because it's like kind of moving around my hands. It's like little white fibers there. Um, it's fiber reinforced, so it does have a little bit of. Uh, Kevlar fiber in there for reinforcement. Nice spot. <laughs> we need giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> a free hat or something. <laughs> Definitely. We'll have uh, people every once in a while that are working with when new, they're new to it. They'll come back and say, I think that there's something in here. We say, yeah, it's, it's normal. <laughs> sure that we have the material off of it. Even if for some reason you use one of the cultured stones as opposed to a real stone, the material is manufactured and then cut up on a piece. So you want to make sure and get any of the manufacturing dust or product off of it so you have a good clean surface. It's a good idea to do a scratch coat on the back of this prior to putting it on. Okay. But what he was asking is if you had some stones and you wanted to apply it with um, material just on the back as opposed to um, in there, we have some contractors do that too. Make sure that we have good coverage on it. We don't have any pockets. We've got here something like that. There, Let's, you do something like that as well. Let's see if we're going to tighten this material up. Or if we've got done it. Yeah, this is going to be loose. This one's going to sag a bit. So we're going to have to tighten this up. What about if the stone, if, if you wash the stone with water? If you wash the stone with water, mm -hmm. that's fine too. You just want to make sure it's free from um, standing water. You don't, you don't but want, but it can be damp. Yeah. Because I noticed you use a dry sponge. 
Yeah, you, what you don't want to do is, especially when you're, if you're trying to get some non-saggers, you don't want the back saturated. Okay, <coughs> damp is fine. Okay, let's see if we can. The dry is good too. Yes, dry is good. So while he's doing that, let me just point out that you see the back of this stone; it's fairly dusty and dirty. So I, I would, I would, you know, wipe it off. And a lot of times, you know, you could still back butter this while it's still wet. Um, you know, it's not like the worst thing in the world. Obviously, this added moisture will then dampen the mix. So it's gotta be on the drier end to do this. Or just, you know, clean off a bunch of stones and leave them like that. But in the sawing process, we create quite a bit of dust. And you'll notice that sometimes the pallets are super clean because they're holding them down as they're loading them. But like this one, that's typical. You know, as you, you know, the top layer is always usually the cleanest because they're holding that one off the most. But as you get down, you're going to see stuff like this. Yep. And it's important to get that off. Hey, did you look at this and you see the problem? Um, the, which trowel to use and stuff like that? No, I mean, what I was going to say is, you know, this trowel that he's using, I don't know the technical term, this is a nice one. Trowel. If you use one like this with the, um, you know, the flat on the bottom, that's a bucket trowel. I like this one the most myself. But, I mean, it's what about just the notch trowel? trowel? Yeah. Well, the notch is good. So if you're going to do a notched here, Say if I'm using, say, round, Boston Blend round, yep. I'm going to use the half-half notch trowel all day long because I'm not doing a lot of cutting. I'm putting up a lot of stone. I'll be honest, I tend to back butter everything. So That's I'm, my school of thought, yeah. too, as I usually do, too. But yeah. I'm just comparing, like, say, a 3 8 notch or a quarter notch to the half Not, Not enough. And okay. what I sometimes do in some of these classes is I stick a stone up and then I immediately pull it off. And if I'm, you, if I'm, you say if I do a quarter, quarter notch versus a half, 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 half wins it over time. Okay. Now if you back butter, you don't have to worry using this enough, but what I want you guys to do is, is once you put your first stone on, your first couple of stones on, rip it off, make sure there's 100% of that back of that stone is covered with cement. It's especially important up across the top. And one of the things, you guys, come over a little bit closer. Um, you know, especially with fit veneer, and you know how a lot of times we have to dry fit it together so that, you know, we're not having cement in between. So make sure that across the top that you do something to make sure that there's plenty of cement across the top so that there's no voids leading it behind the stone. I'm not so worried about the sides and the bottom of a particular stone, but especially that top. Just so the moisture can't get in, in the top and the back? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you see how 100% of that's covered? Yep. That is beautiful. And I do agree. It's a little bit on the super end. So for a, uh, an exterior application, you would want to make sure that this is basically what you're looking at when you pull it off. Yep. You have 100% um, coverage because you couldn't have uh, air or water pockets back there to fill up them. When they freeze, they tend to expand. So. Um, on an interior application, you're doing a fireplace or something like that, it's going to be a little different, but this is really what you want to see when you pull off the There was one job that was done in New Rochelle, New York, that happened to see two stones had fallen off. There was 10 houses stones up there. And I'm like, what? I look at the back of the stone, I'm not joking you guys, they put one little dab of cement here, and one little dab, they bought that spot welder. Yes. And I'm like, oh my god, don't do that. <laughs> so what he's referring to, if you guys have seen it, is uh, so we go to projects all the time, and you find that they have this with the backup stone. Like one of these here. <laughs> no, no, seriously. 
No, no, seriously. One of these here, they'll have three or four of these, okay? So if you can imagine, you have very little coverage there. By the time you get three there, it compresses just a tiny bit. You have very little coverage as opposed to having the full coverage of the entire thing. So everything in here is just a boy or a hollow spot. Uh, we see it on vertical and horizontal applications. It's, you know, you, you want the full spread application. By the way, this is probably about the very biggest of big that we can cut. <laughs> so, so don't expect a lot of the stuff that side to the auto way on it. Look at here. Thank you. So when you pull that cement over there, mm -hmm. you just pull this way. Yeah, because you, if you pull it this way, you get a better hold. And if you go up and down, first of all, you tend to lose more of it when you're going up and down, um, as opposed to across. But when you go across, you get better better hold, better non-sag. So funny. Just so you know, I did it. Yeah, they always say, oh, oh you better hold. It's like a post in a building. It's wet cement. How much hold can you right. get? Right. Wet Right. Amazingly, you can get quite a bit. I, I asked the fellow over here. I, I don't do this routine, but to a lot of guys, you know, he said, start at the bottom, so then you have spaces, so you, to ensure against sagging. Yeah, so if you're starting from the bottom, here's um, kind of a quick touch on that. If you're doing this type of material here, uh, and you start from the bottom, and you lose a little bit on to, you, you, you make a little bit of a mess, and you get some on the front of the stone, it's actual stone. You can probably hit it with a little bit of acid wash, something like this here, even a grinder, you're probably not gonna notice it. The advantage of a non-sag material um, is you can start, you can do a couple up here if you got it, and if you do drop some material down below, there's nothing below it, okay? When you're working with some sort of, have you guys done anything with the cultured stone? Yeah, the, I was the, always taught you have to start at the top and work down. Why? Because if you get anything on it, you can't acid wash it, you take the color off. You're done. Uh, you, you grind off, you, you go from that, it's basically a painted material. Yeah. So you grind off the paint or you acid wash off the paint or something else. Even this right here, just a simple scrubby, um, can, can damage the front of it. So uh, with that there, now keep in mind with those, um, something this size with the engineer type stuff is a fraction of the weight. It's, it's kind of lightweight concrete that's painted. So it's not as durable, but it's lighter weight. So it tends to, to hold a lot easier as well. And I don't know if you guys have ever done brick work, but bricks absorb a lot of the water. The full stones absorb this water quickly and it dries so much quicker. Stone, very low absorption. And so, you know, you were talking about guys like it a good and stiff. The reason we do, when you're using Portland cement and years ago, you'd want it good and stiff so it would fold up. Right. You know, this cement is the same way. I could take high bond, which is supposed to have non-sag. If I mix it dry enough, I can get it pulled without sagging at all. I don't like to play with it that way because your window of time gets compressed. You have, you, you, it, there's a, like I said, with anything, you're gonna work with it. If you're doing a, a larger area and you try and mix it real tight like that, you're gonna have a little bit of a tougher time working with it. You mix it a little bit looser, um, you get more working time. And you know, so depending on how many guys you got, how you're mixing it, where you're with, because uh, your wrists that. and everything, you're putting on dry cement. It's a challenge. Yeah. That's why it's I don't like brick anymore. There's just too much of that repetitiveness. It ruined my wrist. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, that's great. Okay, you're getting to dry this, put this up. So I'm, I'm going I'm to mix up, uh, I'm going to tighten this up even more so you can see the, the variants in it. Um, and then we'll put that on. Put up on it soon. When you mix in half bag and just kind of judging it, it's a little tougher. A full bag, it's easier to measure out. Yes, yes. Pleasure. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Good, good. Excellent. Yes, I appreciate it. Great, great day, guys. Great presentation. Thanks for coming. That's right. Thanks again. You can touch me. I'll see you. Yeah. This one.
you want to try to swallow them first? Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's a little bit more like what you're oh, looking yeah, for. You should yeah. be able to Good to go like this, as you saw before, we kind of had a little bit of there, which would be fine if we were doing something lower or kind of sag, but. Anybody that wants a couple of bags, a couple of bags at no charge, play with them on your next job. It's, uh, it's the first one one way, and it's the second one a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter. Yeah. Yeah. How big's your job? Yeah. I'm doing the foundation around my house. Yeah. How many bags you got? So, yeah. two or, two, if somebody wants two or three bags to kind of play with, we can, we can certainly do those for you. Yeah, because no, he's serious. We, we've got one that we're going to be using. Um, some of the Boston blend and the architect yeah. ones. Are okay. A sample panel. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. If we could take two bags for Perfect. Play with, that would be great. You can take five bags with you. No. 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 Seriously. It's uh. So once you because literally you're going you're going to find everyone mixes it to a different. So if you get through the first bag, you're kind of like oh, it's like we want you to be able to take the second bag and tighten it up and loosen it up or whatever to your needs. Um, and we're confident. I mean, I sell a boatload of this material, guys. Once they start to use it, like I said, for real. When you're doing a section in your first day, like I said, throw a piece up, set it well, leave it. Wait a couple of days and go back and, and pop that thing off. So I got a question for you. We got to put like paint block. Okay. So do we need to paint the block too? No. no. Uh, don't Just paint the block at all. Uh, we want to go over raw concrete. You, you, you go to, to so block. So you're going to use this stuff right over the, the concrete without the... With the air and water stuff. Yeah. Um, it depends on how you're doing a wall or is it the exterior of the it's building. It's a city wall and there's going to be uh, an outdoor kitchen. Uh, it, it would probably be fine without the air and water barrier. Okay. Yep. Foundation too? On the house? Foundation, you're going to talk to, depending on what they have, you're going to want to talk to the architect, you would probably need a water barrier or something like that. Okay. Okay. For, ju for just the standing wall though? Um, Do I need more? I, no, I actually, yeah. Yeah. normally what I say, and, and, and we can debate it because yep. maybe I'm wrong. Um, so on a retaining wall, like you guys talked about, I normally suggest, you know, make sure the surface is fairly good and flat, fill in any voids that are quarter inch gaps or small, you know, because you can have that. And I usually do suggest putting air and water barrier wherever you're going to veneer, and then if you're going to cap a boost on a granite, I usually suggest going across the top. Now, a retaining wall would never put anything on the back side at all. And that way you don't get any effervescence through it. Am I, am I, am I, I way I'm, I'm good with all of that, yes. Okay. So then, yes, I would see a more than that. Okay. I'm telling you guys, I did some work at my house, and I did this, you know, eight, ten years ago. No effervescence. And if you've ever dealt with effervescence, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> there's nothing you can do after it's up. All you can do is clean it, seal it, reduce the amount of water going in, hence reduce the amount of effervescence coming out. So if the job, you know, if you're on a high-end job and a lot of your jobs are short up, then just put it up. It's not worth saving that nickel. I mean, we're talking, you know, a buck, buck and a half a square foot cost. So I say it's worth it. Matt, can I just confirm one other thing? Yes. So a lot of times what I meant to show on this is brick. And one of these stones, this one is stuck on. So what I did was I just put a piece of tape and the finished look was going to be a dry laid look like this. So if you get it perfectly tight, you won't see the red brick below it. But I just did a thin coat of the high bond that's at the job site, or I could use in the empress here. And then after that, then I just started, you know, setting each stone. And so when it's all set and done, it's going to look like this, but I won't see any red brick through it. And this high bond can stick right to 
you know, unpainted brick and stuff like that. It'll, the brick has, you know, tremendous absorption, so it'll bond to that very well. And uh, you get it nice and close there. You, you can even find that uh, you might find um, if you squeeze them together a little bit, the material kind of bunches up and almost creates a little bit of a uh, joint right. for you. And that was gonna, that's leading into a question I had for you. What if you want to eliminate that little bit of cement? You got to use water to clean that out. Are you going to take away the strength of? No. no okay. No. No, because the strength is primarily behind all okay. the stone, not not on the joint. So what I'm saying is, if you guys haven't been using high bond or the latitude cements, this is wonderful. Normally, what we'd have to do to go over brickwork is we'd have to put the wire or cement board or do something and then put it over. This high bond sticks right to the bricks. And, and that concrete and CMU, it's fantastic stuff. Okay. And that's the only reason I put a thin layer is to cover it up. Um, I had a situation that a mason was asking, hey, what do I do? The chimney, the brick chimney was leaking. It was right on the ocean. And literally, the first thing we did was we went over it, similar to what you see here. We filled the joints because this is way more than a quarter inch. And not that the air water barrier can't get in there, but we, we put a thin layer, Put he put ended up putting three coats of the air and water barrier because he just wanted to be sure that this was gonna work. And then he put the stone veneer on it. Actually, before he put the stone veneer on, he tested it, he wet it down. All the leaking water stopped. So he had tested the waterproof and before he put the veneer on, it was a really good idea. So if you're going over brick, you do it this then the air and water barrier rather than the other yes. way around yes okay. because again I, you know i might be going a little overkill because of the, these deep recessions i was just nervous that the air and water barrier so the air and water barrier could bridge a quarter inch gap yep. or less and i just felt like this was too much now in theory if it would stick to the sides and go in and around it might be okay if you get a good heavy coat but to me because bricks typically have fairly recessed joints, I like to fill it with the air. David, so are you exactly what you're saying? I just like to, if you're even just put on a scratch on there, forget about, let's say we're not even gonna use air and water barrier for whatever reason. I like the scratch coat, goes up quick. You use very little material, uh, but you're filling in, you're doing two things. One, you're filling in all of those voids there that yep. something could get in or whatever. But then the other thing is too, you don't know exactly what has been done to this brick. You don't know exactly what they're, so, they may have sprayed some sort of coatings or sealers, and there might be something on there you're not aware about. You come back tomorrow, this thing looks like this, it's solid as a rock, you're good to go. You come back, this stuff, when I tell you bonds like there's no tomorrow, it's unbelievable. You come back and you get some areas that look like it's flaking off, it's kind of a little, you look at it and say, all right, and then come to find out, you test them, they say, oh yeah, last year we had a company came in, and they had bug sprayers and sprayed the sealer all over everything. You didn't tell us that to start with. So kind of, it's a good way of testing, there. you're right. Yeah. Um, and, and what I did, you can see how thin this layer is. So I, I spread some on with one of my trowels and I just used a sponge just to lighten it up. So that's kind of what you see, some of this white. Mm -hmm. That was the wet sponge hitting it. I could have used another trowel, you know, mag trowel or whatever to get a good thin layer. I was just, all I wanted you to see is, you don't need to build this way up. All I'm trying to do is just change the background color of this to the gray. So that when you see through, you don't see the red gray. Okay. And again, if this was an exterior, you get an air and water barrier. I'm trying to show this as an interior. You know, there's a lot of people, like my own house, I, I did this application where I put stone over it. All right. Mm. Also, it worked this time. Did you just put it up? Yeah. Oh, sweet. Holding up like a. Nice. Champ. Like a champ, thank you. <laughs> but you can see, uh, as opposed to the first mix I had, yeah. and this material here, no. yeah. you know, you should be able, when, when you mix it nice and tight for, for heavy stones like this, for non-sag, you should be able to get, you know, a softball-sized glob on your trowel, on this here, and hold it up, you shouldn't go anywhere. If you do and it's a little loose, it's going to work. It's going to bond, trust me. But it's gonna, it's gonna sag a little bit, so. <clears throat> and part of the reason you guys I have that board set up the way it is, when I'm using high bond, I start right at the bottom. If I'm going to leave spacing like I did on that board to the left, is I just put the spacers in. You know, 
These horseshoe spacers, you know, we sell them, but they're widely available. They come in different thicknesses, three eighths, quarter inch, whatever. They're a wonderful tool. And sometimes even on a dry lay, I might put a spacer just to keep it level, because I don't want it, you know, shift in one way or the other. And the cool thing is, yeah, the anti-sag, maybe it works perfectly, but this way you don't have to worry about it with spacers. And then you just take them off the next day and reuse them.